now on the North Hoosick Road. All right. And uh, did you live in Hoosick Falls uh, all your life, or did you, uh, you're an import? No, I was born and brought up here, and I lived right on Barton Avenue, just around the corner. This I was see. Miller's home. I knew all the Millers. There. Yeah. All right. And um, what did you do before you went into the service? Could you tell us a little about it? Uh, before I went into the service, uh, well, I was, I was in Hoosick Falls High School, and uh, when I was 15, I was tall, and I uh, wanted to get with some of my friends who had joined the New York Guard, which was then located in the Armory. The National Guard had left. And that was in 1943, on the, the 11th of August, as a matter of fact. And uh, I enlisted there at the time I was only 15. And my father had to sign the papers to say I was 17. And uh, that didn't go too well at home. But uh, he and my mother started talking to each other again after a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, I was a member of that company. That was uh, Jim Brand was the press right. man, and he was the uh, captain who commanded the company when I joined. And maybe two weeks after I joined, um, Gene Saluzzo was my corporal. I was in his squad, and uh, he told me that they had been talking about me upstairs in the company commander's office. And he said, he doesn't think you're 17. So I said, uh-oh. And I expected a call, and I did get a call. And uh, I went up to see him, and uh, he, he knew me, and he knew my family. I knew his family. And he, he said to me, well, how old are you, Jim? And I said, uh, 17, sir. And he said, fine. That was the end of the conversation. But our unit down here, we had a lot of fellows that joined at about that time. Right. Many of them were joining because the draft was running full tilt and they hoped to get some idea of military life before they might have been called into service. Yeah, there are quite a few that have told me about yeah. being part of that. And uh, I stayed there until, uh, well, let's see, I was in high school and I graduated in 45 and I had enlisted in the Naval Reserve to be called to active duty, but they weren't calling you quickly then, and I was getting a little itchy. So I talked with a Navy recruiter, and he told me, oh, this is just what you want. We have a new program uh, where you can now enlist in the regular Navy. And he said, that's for two years. And I said, oh. And he said, anyone now who's in the Naval Reserve you could enlist for the duration plus six months. So he said, if you didn't like it, you're still required to be there for that six months. He said, why don't you just say, well, throw away those other papers, and we'll make a new set of papers, and you can enlist in the regular Navy. So I said, it sounds good. So he ripped up the set of papers I had, I see. made out a new set, and I enlisted in the U.S. Navy, regular Navy. I see. <clears throat> and I went to... Uh, Camp Perry, Virginia, for my boot training, and uh, then after that I worked there because I had taken some business subjects, including typing in school. Um, they were happy to have anybody that could type, so I got a job working there in the disciplinary barracks, and uh, maybe six months after I got out of boot camp, uh, we created a new brig down in Norfolk, Virginia. It was called Camp Allen. I believe it's still there. And uh, we had all our own general courts martial prisoners there. We had 2,500 plus <coughs> of our boys. And uh, I went down there, and we we reformed the company or the unit there. And I stayed there until I was separated in October of 47. And at that time, I was a third-class petty officer, a yeoman. And uh, I came home, <clears throat> and four days later, I joined the National Guard. I only had a four-day break in service. 
and uh, I was a member of the National Guard. I joined down here. It was then Company C of the 105th Infantry in the Hoosick Falls Armory. And uh, I had to re-enlist as a private again because they said I wasn't qualified to come in, you know, comparable grades. I found out later that I would have been, but that was neither here nor there. So I always admired the people that were here in the units. In fact, during the time I was in the State Guard, I served on several firing squad details when bodies of our people who had been killed in action were brought home. And uh, that always stuck with me. And when I first joined down there, uh, <clears throat> one of the highlights of the annual Armory Stag was they used to call upon Ben Sugden, and he had been the first sergeant in the old 32nd separate company. And he used to get out in the middle of the floor, and from memory, he'd call the entire roll of the unit. And that impressed me. Yeah, I guess so. And I thought, wow, this is good. But I always, in a, in a way, I enjoyed the military, and I saw a lot of the things that happened locally during the war, and I, when they did bring killed in action fellows home, the unit that was there in the armory always assisted in any kind of military honors for it. It was the 105th that left be in 40. Yes. That went. That was headquarters they, detachment yeah. of the 1st Battalion, the 105th then. In fact, when they left I remember them all lining up on the steps of the armory, and then they marched up Elm Street to the railroad tracks, and then down, and they left on trains. So I they see. Went from there. Sorry to interrupt. But oh, that's yeah. okay. Go ahead. So, uh, I then, uh, as I say, I I kind of went through that phase of it, and uh, when I joined the National Guard again, then I I progressed through the enlisted grades. Uh, in fact, I left the unit here in uh, mid-1950, and I transferred from the detachment, or excuse me, the unit that was here, to the state headquarters detachment, because I had gotten a job working in Albany in the adjutant general's office, and uh, that was where the state headquarters was located. So I transferred down there in, I think it was September of 1950, and uh, from that point on, I progressed up through all the enlisted grades, from private up to becoming the first sergeant, and in 1954, I was commissioned direct from the ranks, and uh, staying in the same organizations and with, with a variety of assignments. Uh, I stayed there until I progressed up through the officer grades from second lieutenant, first captain, major, lieutenant colonel, colonel. And uh, when I retired from the National Guard in 77 and my job at the Military and Naval Affairs, I was then the director of military personnel administration for the state. And, uh, I received a promotion at that time to Brigadier General on the state retired list. I see, that's but great. I was still involved with the military because my assignment for most of the time that I was an officer was with the Selective Service System. And uh, they also had, in addition to a National Guard section, they had a reserve section, which happened to be Air Force, <coughs> that met with the guard section, and they had an opening there. The commander had just left, so they asked me if I would like to come on board as a reservist and become the commander of the unit, so I did. I, I was a, a colonel in the Army Reserve, and uh, I stayed there for another five years until I reached age 55, which was the mandatory retirement age. So I served in the military with only a four-day break in service from August 1943 <clears throat> until I was age 55. That's so that was 40 years, a little over 40 years. And I always helped 
as much as I could to get, I won't say the recognition for individuals, but I always made sure that they got their awards and all, which were then handled primarily out of Albany. I see. And I took care of a lot of the fellows that I had grown up with and known. And uh, I still enjoy the military. I see. And uh, could you tell a little more about what you did in Albany, you know, in these different positions that you were in? Uh, well, <laughs> okay. Uh, I worked, as I say, in the headquarters down there, and it, that was a time when there was a draft, and we had a lot of individuals. We used to go on our two-week tour of duty to various locations. In fact, three, four times I was sent to Washington, D.C., to the National Selective Service Headquarters. That's when General Hershey was the director, and I worked down there for my two-week tour. One of the times that I was there working, I worked on uh, Cassius Clay's records. He was having the situation where he refused to serve, yeah, and uh, his name, he had changed his name and all, and I remember going down there and going through his personal copy of the Koran, I believe it was, and there were passages underscored and highlighted and uh, those were the things that they were taking photos of. So that's one of the jobs that I had down there. And uh, down here I worked in the state headquarters, the New York State Headquarters Selective Service. That was then located down on Broadway next to the Federal Building. And later it moved up onto Wolf Road. And uh, we had a number of interesting little incidents that occurred, but uh, some of the things that happened are things that you can't really yeah. tell about. Right. And, uh, All right, so you, you spent 40 years in, in really in the in, military because you were involved with it all the time. Yeah. Now, tell us a little, you got married, I know, because yeah. I know your wife. And yeah. When did you get married? Long, well, oh boy, I have to stop and think. I think I was in, I know I was in my 30s something, <laughs> 37 or so. Yeah. And uh, I kidded her about, well, I married a child bride. <laughs> but we have uh, three children. Our oldest daughter is Stacy. She still lives here in the village. Our middle daughter went to Norwich University on a military scholarship graduated from there and was commissioned in the regular army and she presently is a captain uh, an army nurse and she's stationed now down at uh, Fort Campbell Kentucky and our son is still residing with us at our home on the North Oosic Road I see and, uh, okay so we got a pretty good picture of your life and then what you did is there anything uh, you'd like to talk about Hoosick Falls and his service that you'd like to put on tape before we the things, as I say, the things that I can recall primarily were the the individuals whose bodies were brought home after being killed overseas. Uh, some of the fellows that were on Saipan, I was here as a member of the unit when they were brought home. Those that were killed in uh, Europe. In fact, I remember a fellow who was a sergeant down here in the company, Dick Albergine. He was killed in action, but his body wasn't brought home, but he was killed in, in Europe. Yeah, right. And uh, a number of other fellows, guys that I grew up with, a lot of people, whether because we were not close to the sea, they chose the Navy. And that's what I really did, too. Yeah, right. I enjoyed the tour, but the, the prisoner population, yeah, was. like I say, it was amazing. And as in, we had 2,500 of our own people locked up. And I remember one evening I was coming in off Liberty and I got off the bus on Tossig Boulevard in Norfolk, which is just across the road from where the Camp Allen is. And as I walked up the incline across the tracks, uh, I could hear someone yelling, halt, halt. And I thought, I hope they're not talking, there were a couple of us here. I said, they're not talking to us. And then I heard a couple of shots. <laughs> what the heck is this? And they had barbed wire fences with about six foot of broken shells in between them, and it was all lit up. And it was one of the Marines up in the tower. And some fellows had uh, 
walked across from the top of a freight car that was inside the fences on a, on a big plank. They walked to the first fence, then they jumped to the second fence, and they had tried to get over the top of the barbed wire that was there. And one of them made it, and he was, it was probably 12 or 14 feet off the ground when he got over. And he, he was climbing down the other side, and that's when the Marine so. sentry fired. And uh, I remember the guy fell to the ground, and I thought, I don't know whether he's dead or what. Yeah. But we started, this other fellow and I, we started running toward him. And uh, the Marine just yelled, you know, stay away, don't go near him. And uh, I went in inside the camp after, and they had him in the dispensary. And one of the shots, had, he, he apparently was hanging off the fence, you know, let, trying to let himself down. And <clears throat> the bullet went across under his arm, right across his chest, not not deeply, not just, in, just like it was burned across. Yeah. And then it hit the other arm and broke it. He was lucky. He was lucky he didn't get killed. And then another time, they they used to try to break out every once in a while. And, uh, I remember they had rigged up a radio station in one of the buildings there. And you'd go into the shower room, they found this out after, because they cut in on one of the Norfolk radio stations. And they said something that wasn't too polite, you know, this is station so-and-so from yeah. Syphilis City, Tennessee. <laughs> and I said, uh-oh. And uh, they found the radio after that. It had been built in and put back into the wall. And they had the antenna up in the ceiling, way up top. And uh, they would pull a rope, and that would extend it. They had it up there like on a pulley. And they'd pull it back out to its full length, and then they'd pull it back in out of sight. Wasted time, uh, wasted brain power. They, if they were smart enough to do that, they, they could have. They, they were smart. Some of them, but as they say, they <laughs> yeah. were our own people. And then we used to ship plane loads of them up to the disciplinary barracks, which was then Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And we used to volunteer to go as what they called them, chasers. And uh, we'd be armed and we'd go with the, the bunch that was being shipped up there. And when we got up there, always someone met us at the airfield. And uh, <clears throat> one of those was like a, well, it was an older aircraft, but they used it regularly. And one time, that one was lost off the Atlantic coast, we never did find the plane. Uh, they found parts of two or three of the, the crew that were coming back from that trip. But uh, there were always things going sure on. Is. And uh, we used to get sent out into what had been a German POW stockade, which was behind our quarters. And uh, they had their huts all fixed up neat. And <clears throat> you could tell which organizations had been there because they had little rock gardens. And the, the ones that were aloof and stayed away from the others were the SS troops. They didn't mix with even their own troops. They had their own huts all yeah, to yeah. one end. Nobody messed When was this? Uh, this was in yeah. 46 and 47. Right. Was that after the war and yeah, they were still the there? Yeah. There, there were no longer any yeah, I see prisoners there, there, but that was what they used for that during the war. That, that they you had German German prisoners of war were in there, and uh, that was an interesting situation. And we talked to some of the people that were still there. That were there were still some German prisoners there, and uh, they were being sent back home at that time. But two or three of them, I remember one one boy in our unit, his uncle was still from Italy. <clears throat> and uh, this fellow got talking to one of the prisoners one day, and he said something about he had no idea where his family was or if they were alive. Well, he lived in the north of Italy, and right on the German border. and. He said, well, my uncle is there. And he said, I'll tell my father and see if he can contact my uncle and they may be able to locate your family. And then perhaps a 
a period of a month and a half, he had a message back that they had located the fellow's yeah. wife and a couple of his children. And uh, he, he just, he had been captured in uh, Africa. He had been wow. a member of the Africa Corps. So he was in prison a long time. He'd been in there a, a number of years. Yeah. And uh, these were the, the kind of things that make it interesting. Yeah, human interest stories. Human interest stories. Yeah. Well, we thank you for your information, okay. and we thanks, thank you a lot for coming.